All right, cool. All right, so welcome uh, one and all. Uh, we may get some people that will join us and obviously we're gonna be recording this for later, but welcome for uh, welcome to our third and I think final for this semester uh, speaker series from the VSGI. So we were able to get uh, Nathan to come on in and, and chat with us a little bit and, and talk about uh, getting a job, keeping a job, all the wonderful stuff that goes about, you know, actually getting an industry job and, and he'll give you a little bit more about uh, what he's done and where he comes from and stuff. And some of you may already know this because you may have, you know, had him in class and stuff like that, but, uh, but still um, very interesting journey through uh, school and graduate school and, and into, you know, a, a cool job, which we were talking a little bit before we just started. So, um the, the the format of this is i think nathan has some slides he's going to talk for a little bit uh are you okay with people posting questions in the chat as they go all right perfect yes, absolutely. um and then obviously if you post questions in the chat uh we can also keep or or answer them when we get to the end and feel free to just queue them up so that we can uh have a, a nice q a we're going to open it up after after that um but yeah, this, this is an information session, pass on information, chit chat, all that wonderful stuff. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to pass it off to Nathan uh, and let, let him take over. I will turn off my mic, kind of slink into the background and let you do your thing for a little bit and then I'll rejoin as needed uh, as we go. All right, sounds good. Um, okay, I'm screen sharing here. And yeah, let me make sure I have chat over here, just in case I can yep, see. Yep, looks good. And I can right. always yell in case, you know, somebody says something, so. Perfect, All perfect. Right. All right, welcome everyone. This presentation I'm going to give is called Getting a Job in the Game Industry, Preparing and Persevering. I'd like to start off by telling you a vision. This vision is that games development companies should be able to create high quality games on reasonable timelines without any crutch. Um, wouldn't that be a nice vision of the world we could achieve to make amazing games in short timelines without any crunch? That'd be great. Um, unfortunately, this goal is laughable. And you might be wondering, why is this goal um, laughable more generally? And the problem is this. Making games is really hard. And so if you are somebody who may not have a lot of experience making games and you want to make games, um, companies that might want to hire you might consider you high risk. Are you going to be able to deliver on helping us make this game and get it out faster? Or are you going to add more bugs than you remove in our game? Um, and from this chart, what you can see is that uh, this is a chart from Hitmarker, which is a site which hosts game jobs. Um, the percentage of jobs that are considered entry level, where you don't really need any experience, is 5% of the jobs that they post on that site. At the junior level, you have a small amount of experience, is around 8 to 9%. At the intermediate and senior level, that's over 85% of jobs posted. Um, and so why was the vision laughable? Well, that's because there is an intense demand for people at the intermediate and senior skill level in the game industry, but, they're, but companies aren't hiring people to come in at the entry level to grow into those roles. Um, and because there's a lack of intermediate and senior developers, that leads to crunch and delays and budget overruns and broken games as people are overtaxed and having to do too much. How do we solve this as a problem? Well, I would like to say we should enable companies to improve game delivery quality and velocity through hiring junior and entry-level developers. Um, and this can be, take part in two major forms. On education institution side, places like George Mason, we should be improving game education quality to place graduates at the intermediate skill level after graduation, where they see there's a demand for those intermediate skill level jobs. And for game companies, they need to improve their production processes to better incorporate entry and junior hires in a low-risk way so they can help the game get delivered faster and at a higher quality. But who could do such a thing? Hello, it's me. I'm Nathan Hahn. Um, I'm a producer and I'm a programmer. I consider myself a programmer and producer in games, and I'm in both worlds. I'm an instructor at George Mason, as well as an associate producer at Bethesda Game Studios. So hopefully I can help both of those sides accomplish that mission. I have an MA in computer game design from George Mason University, as well as an MBA from Clarebridge University, and I am passionately driven about games. I have released two indie game titles, and I'm not afraid to program in Notepad when you need to get something done. 
This presentation is about preparing yourself with the skills needed to deliver high quality work that improves outcomes for game companies, as well as persevering through the application process of getting a game industry job by proving you will be a low risk hire for the company. You need to do both of these things in order to prepare to work in the game industry. First part, preparing. Three steps here. First, you need to know yourself know who you are. Secondly, you need to do your research about the game industry and game industry jobs. And thirdly, you need to show your skills to do things. Firstly, know yourself. There's a, I could go in much more into depth. I have bonus slides on this if you're interested, um, but there's four kind of core roles for the game industry I would bring up, which are designer, uh, where you want to make some make games that are meaningful, a programmer, you want to make games feel good to play, an artist, you want to make games look good, and a sound designer, you want to make games sound good. Um, there are plenty of other types of roles that, um, that you might want to go for, but these are kind of the core four when it comes to the mean potatoes of people who are building games on a day-to-day -day basis. Every role in the game industry is about delivering high-quality work with high-tech tools. Expect to use a lot of different software in your job, no matter what role you're going to have. After you know yourself, you need to do your research, tracking. Uh, my recommendation is if you're looking to get started with this, find 100 jobs. 100, it's a nice round number. And then write down for those jobs what those companies want, what those jobs require. My own process for this is I love Microsoft Excel. So I took a bunch of jobs and I added some links. And I literally copied and pasted all of their requirements and qualifications. And by doing that over a hundred jobs, I was able to get an appreciation for what kind of jobs are out there. It also lets you know who's hiring and who's not hiring. What skills are they looking for? And what skills might you need to develop in order to work there? There's lots of sites you can do this. LinkedIn is a classic one. Um, companies are available on there. Hitmarker is a great game job site because it's strictly games. That's what you're gonna find there. Work with Indies is great if you want to see some more indie development type jobs rather than AAA. Um, don't forget company websites. Every game development company has a website where they have a careers page and you can look up what jobs they have, um, as well as some other general sites like Indeed and Monster, but I would consider those top four to be the best ones. Now, you need to show your skills. You need to make a portfolio. Any students who are in my portfolio class, you'll this is the entire semester dedicated to making a portfolio because it's very important. On your portfolio, you should have your games, you should have your art, you should have your sound design work. And as part of your portfolio, you should be explaining your process for how you made things. Um, and that's the full scope of preparing. Once you're at that, you're at the persevering stage, which is the hard part. Because once you have the initial setup, you got to keep going through a number of years in order to get a job. Three steps to this. You should be applying, you should be networking, and you should be continuously improving your portfolio. So once you set up your portfolio in the preparation stage, you're continuing to work on it over time. Apply to jobs. My recommendation is try to apply to 10 jobs a week, um, simply because it's important to keep looking at jobs that are out there and evaluate them against what you have. And if it's if what you have is remotely close to what applies there, just apply. What's the worst they can do? Reject you, not call you back. Um, but doing this is going to constantly give you a feedback loop of, hey, um, do I think what my skills are going to match what this job is? Or you know, give you feedback in that regard. Again, dare to excel. I love Excel, and that's what I used for tracking my own application process because it was really handy. When you're doing 10 applications a week, it's going to go haywire in a hurry if you don't have a good tracking process. So make sure you have that. Limit your application customization. There's a temptation to say, I'm going to spend three to four hours crafting the perfect application, which will include a highly customized resume, a perfect cover letter. But I'd recommend pursuing... Um, not spending overspending your time in that regard, because ultimately you don't know the state of a job that you find on a website. Um, that job may be in a late interview stage, and they may not even consider you, not because you're not qualified, but because they've already mostly picked out a candidate, and they just forgot to take down the job already. Um, That's why it's important to maintain velocity, because you don't know what's happening on the back end. So just make sure you're keeping your eyes out and applying as jobs come up. And then do preparation for the interview. You'll find lots of great sources out there on how to prepare for interviews, things like preparing for 
specific questions um, that you can kind of look up online for your roles, um, as well as having some good boilerplate answers on ways you can connect your resume and portfolio for the job. Um, in terms of other application customization, I did do a little bit in my own search where I had three different resumes. I had one resume that was a programming resume, another one that was a pr producing resume, a production resume, and a third one that was a data analyst resume. Um, so it's okay to do some customization, but try not to like, you know, overly customize for each individual job, figure out the general rules you want to go for, and then apply from there. Let's talk about networking. Um, lots of Lots of students have come up to me and said, I know I need to network, but I feel like I'm really bad at it. And so I'm curious for a little bit of audience participation moment, um, if you want to post it in the chat, when you think networking and professional networking for advancing your career, what comes to mind? What do you think about when you think, hey, yeah, I need to do some of that networking stuff? Chat five. Sorry, it was a, it was a networking joke. I had to do mm, it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. True. It's what comes well, to other, mind. It's what well, I ask other for. people, well, other people hopefully type. Mm. Folks, feel free to to, to participate. <laughs> yep. I'll give it like a minute. In the meantime, you can admire this beautiful Geffy graph. Attending job fairs. Yep. Okay. Used to be really good at Geffy. It was one of my favorite tools. You go charts of things, bubbles connected, network graphing. It's very fun. All right. Well, we'll take that. We'll take that response of like attending job fairs. Yes. Um, sure. Um, I like to think of networking in a very broad sense, and I break it down into three specific things. Oh, going to ECDC. Yeah. And then never got past like the convention participant line discussion. Hmm, different conversations. Yeah, you know, again, you know, when people think about networking, they tend to think it's like really hard and they're not quite sure how to proceed with it. I break it down into three specific things. One, networking is ask people questions. Two, identify their needs. And three, show how you can provide the solution for the need. Um, that's really what it comes down to in networking and how I think about it. Um, because this allows you to figure out, to turn just meeting someone randomly into a connection that you can take long-term. Because if you know what people want and you show how you can provide what those people want, well, they're gonna wanna stay in touch with you over the future and may have an opportunity for you in the future. But that only happens after you ask people questions and identify their needs. If you don't know what people need, then you have not made a meaningful network connection. Um, and if you can't show that you can provide for that need, that's also not a meaningful network connection. Um, you really got to go through those three parts to have a solid network connection that's going to be good for you in the long term. And there's two ways to think about this. Um, if you are kind of looking for a job and you're going to someplace like a job fair where you've got a recruiter at the company, that's more of a service style networking where you're figuring out somebody who has like say a bunch of positions, a kind of different degree of power and influence than you. And you're asking if you can solve their problems with your skills. The company attended a job fair because they need people to do things. Um, and it's up to you to ask good questions and figure out what they really need. Usually they're good at telling you that, sometimes they're not. Um, so identify their needs and show you can provide for that. But networking can also mean partnerships where you find someone who's at the same influence level as you and kind of same power level. And you think, do your needs align for collaboration towards shared goals? And I'm going to go much more into depth on this, talking about different places you can do networking. Um, I am totally biased. I feel like my success at networking has been due to game jams. Um, and at a game jam, you get together with a group of people and you make a game over a weekend. Um, and the important thing at game jams is you find team members who complement your skills and you create a cool game. Um, one of the best things you can do for networking at a game jam is start off with an opening question. Can I play your game? And this is actually how I got my probably most important networking connection I ever made um, while at a game jam. So I would, took part in this game jam, Global Game Jam 2016. 
And myself and Patty, we were both at the jam, but on separate teams. And at the end of the jam, she went up and presented her game. And I thought it was really cool. So afterwards, I went up to her and asked, hey, can I play your game? And then we got to talking a little bit more about what she wanted to do. And she said, I want to make games about cross-cultural communication. And I was like, hmm, I want to make games about cross-cultural communication. And then she said, well, I'm a designer, but I'm going to need a programmer to do that. And I was like, well, I'm a programmer and I don't have any design ideas. So it turned into a six-year working relationship. And we released The Girl Who Sees based off of this initial conversation that some American University marketing person took. Um, this is literally where my game development journey started. I talk with someone and ask to play their game because I thought it was cool. Um, and it turned into something really, really good over time. I've been on, I've been to over 10 game jams, definitely, maybe up to 20 at this point. And I've talked with lots of people. Um, and this was one great instance that I had. Secondly, um, education. Congratulations, you have a networking cheat code and the fact that you're probably attending George Mason University or another school related to game design. Talk to your classmates. They are very effective people to network with because you both share the same kinds of goals. You wanna make cool games, that's the point. Um, and based on talking with your classmates, build strong teams for group projects. Um, and afterwards, maybe you ask the question, wanna keep working together on this? Um, and it turns out I asked that question after a class, and it ended up being a three-year journey into releasing Give the People What They Want. Um, this started in Sang's VR class, uh, which I was taking at George Mason at the time, just because I had gotten laid off from a job and I was looking for things to do. <laughs> but it turns out I liked working with my team, and I asked the question, and we did it. Um, so talk with your classmates and ask questions. Figure out what they need. Um, and that'll help you figure out if you want to work together and network in the future. Events. You can find lots of events related to game design through lots of sites like meetup.com, Eventbrite, school events. There's lots of sites where people host events that are being hosted and develop connections over time. Meet people there, find collaborators and people who can share expertise and ask the question, do you have any game ideas you're working on? Um, that's a great opening question so that people can say, yeah, I'm working on this game and it's going to have all of these things. And they may say, oh, but I'm going to need an artist or a sound designer, or I'm going to need this specific thing. Um, and that's a great way to develop a networking connection. If you're someone who can provide that. I actually run the International Game Developers Association DC chapter, where we meet on the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month. So if you want to network at an event, come to IGDADC. It's lots of fun. And conferences like ECGC. Um, at conferences, you find out why other people are there and you talk to presenters and figure out what their needs are and be ready to show your skills on the dot. Um, this is, if you're in my portfolio class, you may be appreciative of my extra credit assignment where I require you to present your portfolio to your webcam from your phone because you should be able to show your work from your phone to somebody at a conference. Um, as soon as they say, yeah, I'm looking for people who are good at design, programming, art, sound, um, being able to pull up your work and show that to somebody immediately um, can help develop a good network connection. And you can start this off by simply asking people you meet, hey, what panels are you going to? Um, and, and that can be a, you know, a jumping off point to figure out, well, what are they interested in? Why are they here? And that helps you identify what their needs are. And then from there, you can also ask the people who are, pre who are presenting, um, why did they show up here? Why are they presenting? What do they need? Think about, that should be their continual line of thought if you're networking at conferences. All right, last big section of this presentation is how to continuously improve. You've made your portfolio. You've started applying. Again, start applying and then continuously approve after you start applying. Um, there's lots of places you can do this, like game jams, long-term projects, mentorships, and maybe certifications. I am biased towards game jams, since that's how I got most of my continuous improvement. Um, and I would recommend if you're looking for a project to add to your portfolio, think about goal-oriented jam participation. If you want to be a specific role, try to join jams that are going to help you build your skills in that role. If you're a gameplay programmer, maybe a game jam about physics, because physics systems are always complicated and need really talented gameplay programmers to solve. Um, if you want to be a UI artist, maybe the clicker jam where you create a game where you just click buttons, but it has to have really cool art to keep people engaged. Or if you want to be a narrative designer, a visual novel jam where it's a 
you know, a lot of text, a lot of reading and some characters, a lot of dialogue, that can be a great portfolio piece to show you can be a good narrative designer. In those jams, don't be afraid to cut. Um, in a jam, you're trying to think about a very limited scope and try to limit the scope to create a small polished project. And think about, is your planned work going to help you improve your skills? If it's not, don't be afraid to cut out of the jam. Um, and, and thirdly, are these the type of people you want to network with? Um, if they're here for just a completely different reason than you are, and you have trouble identifying their needs, then maybe this isn't the best jam. You can also think about competitive jams. Um, and and com going into a game jam where you want to compete can be a great way to show understanding of what high quality work is like. Um, if you place first in a game jam where there are 1,000 jam 1,000 games submitted, that's a great item to put in your portfolio. And secondly, long-term projects. Again, this is something that I did for both the girl who sees and give the people what they want. In games, think about doing commercial releases. A lot of students are very scared and timid about taking their senior capstone project and turning it into something that goes on a store for money. And rightfully so, it can be really scary, but it's really important to do. And the reason why is if you're looking to work in the game industry and not be a hobbyist, what you're telling a company is that your work is worth money. And if you're too afraid to release your work for money, what does that say to an employer who might want to hire you? Um, so really, you may get some rough criticism. Give the People What They Want has gotten some really rough criticism from our release, but it's been good feedback. It's helped me to learn and to grow. And it's shown that I'm not afraid to say that my work is worth money. Um, even if maybe it's not the work, a work that everybody would like. There's also other long-term projects you can do. If you're an artist, a sound designer, or programmer, you can think about creating small asset store assets. So if you've worked in Unity or Unreal, you're familiar, those places have asset stores where people can download things. If you're a programmer, consider making some game dev tools that people might want to use, like in this Unity store, there's this dialogue editor. Um, or if you're an artist sound designer, guess what? There's always people who need more good sounds to put in the game and good art that's well put together. Um, and if you're not looking to do something commercial or along those lines, consider open source projects. Those can also be viable ways to improve your skills. If you're a designer, think about participating in modding projects. There's lots of modding projects out there for Skyrim specifically where it's large teams putting together these projects. Joining one of those can be a great way to develop your skills. If you're a programmer, consider contributing to open source software. That shows that you can work with other people and identify who's using this software and what improvements need to get made. And if you're an artist or sound designer, consider contributing to open game art. There's always designers looking for free art and free sound for their game jam games. And if you contribute to a site like this and your art pack or sound pack gets downloaded 10,000 times, Put that on your resume saying, I've created something that people really like, and I could create this for you if you wanted. Thirdly, mentorship. Um, mentorship is about identifying a mentor in your specialty, maintaining a long-term working relationship, and then showing those people continual progress over time. Um, there's kind of informal ways to do this, reaching out on LinkedIn, meeting someone through an event or a conference, but there's also more formalized ways of doing this. Um, the International Game Developers Association actually has a mentorship program. If you join the IGDA, you can take part in this mentorship program where they'll help match you with a mentor in your field. I would say mentorship is the most important for people looking to get into art and sound design, because those are two fields where you need somebody who's really experienced, giving you feedback, telling you how to improve, and then continually iterating on that to improve your work. Whereas for a programmer, as a mentorship, it can still be good, but it's harder to get into the grind of that loop of somebody like reading through your code and providing good feedback because every code project is going to be so wildly <laughs> different. It's harder to give consistent feedback than it is for artists and sound designers. Certifications. Should you get certifications? It's a common question. There is like some fields where getting a certification will be helpful and others not so much. If you're working in serious and educational games, I would actually recommend consider getting a certification because in the serious and educational game field, usually it's companies hiring game developers and they tend to have trouble evaluating people's skill levels because they don't make games usually. Um, and so having somebody who's certified gives them a little stamp that says, okay, somebody else said this person knows what they're doing. So they're more likely to look over your application. 
if you're not, if you're working in kind of double A contract work for other companies, it can sometimes be helpful to get certifications because if you're doing contract work and you get certified, usually that means you can, that means your company can build, build the client more, which is nice. <laughs> If you're in AAA game development, eh, not so much. Usually if you're working in a AAA game, you're working on a game which has a very customized system that's been developed over a long period of time. And a certification general tool may or may not actually help you with your job. And indie game development, absolutely nobody cares. It's all about your work. Show what you can do. Um, getting a certification won't really help you much in the indie game space. And then in terms of roles, from will benefit your career to absolutely nobody cares, um, I would say programmer is really helpful here because you can get certificates and things like engines and programming languages and specific programming tools. And that can be sometimes helpful for a sound designer, getting a certification in one of the advanced software tools like WYs that can be somewhat helpful um, just because those tools, it's hard to use them effectively unless you're working on a really big project with a lot of people. So it's hard to put together a good portfolio piece um, for using those types of tools for an artist. Um, it's, I would say, probably the least, probably not very helpful, just because as an artist, you can see what the work is like, and they will know your skill level based off of what you have in your portfolio at a glance. Um, so it, because it's really easy to see your level of quality, certifications, I would say not really needed. As a designer, nobody knows what certifications you should get as a designer. So designer, you got to build games. It's the only way to make that happen. Wrapping up, the end of this presentation, I would like to ask you, where do you think you are now? Um, for some of you, you may feel like you are at the entry level here. For some of you, you may feel, I'm gonna do this. Um, for some of you, you may feel like you're at the entry level here. Um, and let me tell you, there is a lot of competition here for a small slot of jobs. At the junior level, you have some experience, it's a little better. But where you really wanna be is here. And as you're continuously improving, you should be thinking, how do I get here? Because that is where you're going to find a job um, and it's going to be a lot easier than trying to fight through these two. And so hopefully this presentation has given you some tools and what steps do you think you need to take, take to reach your goal? Um, if you have any thoughts about that, post it in the chat. Um, but otherwise, that's the end of this presentation. Um, hopefully you know how to prepare by knowing yourself, doing your research and showing your skills. And hopefully you feel confident in persevering by applying, networking and continuously improving. And that's it for my presentation. It's time for questions. Cool. Well, if you want to go ahead and uh, take it down, um, and we'll just you know show your face, and then people can you know either raise their virtual hand or they can type some questions in the chat and ask, um, and go from there. Uh, there we go. I already got a question in the chat. <laughs> yep. How can you tell what level you're at? looking through the requirements of job applications or simply gauging your own experience. I would say the, the number one way is looking through job applications. What are their qualifications? How many of those can you check off? Um, and that's something where, again, when you do your tracking, copy down those qualifications. And one recommendation I often have is literally print out your ideal job, stick it above your computer, and everything you're doing, think about how is this helping me check one of those boxes? Um, and bend whatever work you're doing now for school, for your other assignments, um, for any of your extracurricular work, bend it towards what that job requires. The second part would be um, for sound design and art, especially finding a mentor who is already at that level. Um, because if they are already at that level, they can help look at your portfolio and look at your work and say, yeah, this is intermediate level work, or no, you need to learn how to do this, 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 and this before you're at this level. Um, for designers, programmers, it's a, it's a little bit harder because it's harder to experience quality at a glance from the programming and design aspect. But for art and sound, it's easy for someone to look at your portfolio for five minutes and tell you where you are and what, where you need to go. Cool. I keep typing out questions or raise your hands and we'll go from there. Um, so I know you went, uh, you were, you said you're an associate producer, um, yep. at, uh, at Zenimax, uh, and we'll get the next question in just one sec. But um, so you're doing production, you know, which, like you said, you do some programming, you did some production, you did these different things. When you were applying for jobs, what do you think um, of the stuff you did, or the stuff that you highlighted, or that you talked about in the interview? Like, 
what do you think probably had the most, or maybe they told you, like had the most impact on you being able to show that you could do that particular job uh, and them hiring you into it? I would say probably the biggest one was the long-term project, The Girl Who Sees. Because of the fact that, A, it was in a little bit of their genre, which is RPG kind of stuff. And obviously it's not open world or anything, but I had experience putting together a level up system, a skill system, narrative system, um, mini games that you do, a battle system, tying that all together. Um, That's obviously the, at a very smaller scale, the same challenges that Bethesda has with their large scale games. And the the other important aspect of that was as a long-term project, we brought on some additional programming help to work on the project. And so I had a, I got experience as a lead programmer trying to work with other people who were skilled at what they did, but maybe not the best at integrating into our project. And I had a lot of a lot of talk during my interview about how do you deal with, you know, programmers of different skill levels? And well, mm-hmm. I had on the ground experience with that working on this project. Um, I had interns who worked for free and people who we hired. And sometimes right. the interns were fantastic. Sometimes the people we hired were garbage. <laughs> and it's just how that is sometimes. Right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> have there been any, um, you know, obviously without giving any specifics out necessarily, but have there been any big surprises uh, since you went in? I, I, I know you did some work, again, in a different field than games, like you were more yeah. IT and stuff like that. But was there any surprises when you came in um, and started working at Zenimax um, that you weren't necessarily expecting or, or different levels of expectations that you, you had, that kind of thing? Hmm. I will say it was, you know, slightly surprising, but not so much, but in a very, very good way. Um, my, from my experience working on The Girl Who Sees, where I had to be very independent and figure things out on my own and Google things when I didn't know. I love working in a larger company because I can like ask people who are more experienced for advice on things. It's really, really helpful. That's Um, good. (laughs) And and I would say the other aspect that was surprising is me coming in as a producer. I have on all my game projects usually been the most technical person on those projects. Um, And suddenly I'm now in a room where there's people who have done really complicated C++ programming for 25 years. If somebody else on my team has been working there for 23 (laughs) and it's like, I now have to figure out how to communicate well, what our goals are with these people who really know what needs to get done, but who, you know, need somebody to advocate for them in the organization, because um, that's kind of my role as, as the producer, this middle line between QA is saying, this is what they want. Programmers have some ideas about what should be done. And then you've got the senior leadership team who also has some ideas about what the game should be. And as a producer, you're in the middle of that, trying to make oh, the yeah. best decision possible. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. I, I had the same thing back in the day, right? You had to learn the language of those people. And sometimes, like you said, like the, especially when you get to the senior people who have been around a while, they have this, the stuff that they're just kind of like, this is how we talk. And you're like, oh, what? Are, okay, let me figure this out first. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We had another question in here. Let's see. I'm going to scroll up. How can you narrow down on things that you're good at? Like, this person feels like they enjoy making everything like art, right, sound, and program and don't know where to focus. Mm. If you're somebody who likes art, sound, and programming, and you don't know where to focus, I would say keep your eye out for more indie game development roles. Because if you're working in a giant AAA company, that's a role where you're going to be doing something specific. And they're going to say, well, you got you to pick. But if you're in an indie studio where it's a much smaller organization, you can contribute in all those ways. Um, But in terms of like, how do you figure out, my recommendation is work on lots of team projects. And if you're working on a team project, eventually you're going to figure out which role you filtered into based off of the skill sets of the other people. And it's a very complicated dance when you're doing a group project because you want to do the thing that you want to do, but you also will recognize there's things that have to get done. And you may have to fall back and do some of those things that maybe you're not the best at, but you've had to do them because somebody's got to do it. And as a producer, you often find yourself in that role doing all those things. So I would say, hey, yes, you may enjoy all those things, but also consider um, starting in one of those areas, but becoming a producer because you get to engage with art and sound and programming um, as long as you're good at communicating with lots of people, because that's the key skill of a producer. Very true. Okay, so the next one was about 
would you recommend taking CS classes if you're looking to specialize in gameplay programming roles? Mm. I would say no, specifically for gameplay programming. There's a, there's a there's a slide later on about all the different types of roles you can have for programming, and there's lots of different roles you can have for programming. Um, there's like gameplay, there's tools, there's UI, there's systems, there's graphics. And if you want to engage in like what I would call the systems graphics tools area, those would be good candidates for, yeah, take a CS class. Um, because if you're trying to do graphics, like you got to know the really complicated low level CS stuff in order to make the picture show at 60 frames per second. It's really hard stuff. Um, but for gameplay programming, it's far more often that you're going to be working on like small, limited features and trying to fix bugs and being able to read through and identify problems. So it's more, I would argue it's more helpful to focus on develop your own projects where you get to build a game of a specific type. So if you want to be a gameplay producer and you want to work on first person shooters, build your own first person shooter. Follow some tutorials, of course, but add some spin on it. If you want to work on role-playing, turn-based role-playing games, well, program a turn-based role-playing game. That's going to tell you infinitely more about how to program than a CS class will um, in terms of yep. gameplay programming specifically. And the more you can even, like if you just make a first-person shooter, the more you can tweak it and make it your own and show how you changed it versus just getting a template, the better too, right? Because you're showing exactly. creativity. Um, uh, so you got another one. What do you what do you think about remote work? Um, or, you know, jobs doing that now. Good for growth. Better to be in the office. I, I don't know what you're mm -hmm. doing currently with you know Zenimax, but um, I, I know you've probably done a little bit of both. What What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I would say remote work is a really, really, really weird place right now in the tech industry as a whole, because a lot of people say, yes, I love remote work. It's worked out well for me. Um, and a lot of companies are saying, no, actually, we want people back in the office. And so there's a little bit of a tension there. I will say for my own role at um, Roll Up Bethesda, I work with a team and a third of my team is in Texas, a third of my team is in Canada, and a third of my team is in Rockville. So like, I can come into the office, but I'm not actually going to be able to talk with a lot of the people on my team if I do so. So, um, or at least, you know, talk face to face. I'm just going to be talking over the webcam at the office. So there's, you know, some circumstances where it's nice to come in. And um, in, more generally in the industry, I will say it's, it's leaning towards kind of trying to get back to in-person experience just because people have such good memories of what it's like to build a game in person and to get through that final push and ship a game um, that they're trying to get back to that. Whereas people who may not have that experience are like, why would I ever want to do that? It's kind of a really enlightening experience working together with somebody in person. If, you know, I participated in the Global Game Jam in person for eight years, seven years before they went to virtual online. And you can get things done online, but there's like a vibe going in person. And I would say for early in your career, it can be tough working remote if you don't already know what you're doing, because you may not know the questions to ask. And it's helpful to have side conversations with people to be like, complain about your problems more generally. Um, and again, we I've talked about this with some of the people on my team. It can be hard for them to just say, hey, can I just like call you up and complain at you for 15 minutes? And I'm like, yes, please do that. But it's a weird thing to like ask, right? <laughs> so sometimes you just got to complain to your producer for 15 minutes about something that's going on. Um, and if you're not already experienced at why you'd want to do that, um, it can be hard to get that momentum going. So that's why I recommend in person. It's not, I, I wouldn't say it's absolutely required. But if you're not in person, make sure that you've got regular conversations and you're coming to those conversations with good questions that you want to ask and learn from others. Yeah. And I'd say like, you know, when I was a producer, it was mostly in, in person and I've seen both, but yeah, I agree with you on most of those points. It's like, it's so much easier just to walk over to somebody or listen to other people chat about things and go, oh, that's what I'm working on. When you do that online, you're not just sitting all in a thing and listening to the room, you're you're usually just getting together at, at certain times and things like that. And so it, it loses some of that spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And as a producer, it was, it was amazing just to be a sponge and listen to what people were doing and know where they are before they even told me. Mm -hmm. And so you just don't get that in that kind of online. So, um, all right. So we had the next one was, how do you know if a company is a good fit for you? Are there signs or red flags that you uh, either when searching for or interviewing with a uh, uh, potential company? 
Oh, that's a really good question. What would be some what would be some red flags I'd look out for? You know, I would you know the the only the only big red flag that I would say um is a potential red flag is if like they call you in for an interview and then you, you know, again, you applied for a job, they call you in for an interview and then you look back at your application and their qualifications and you're like this doesn't line up. Um, yeah, you you said it was a long shot. I'll give it a try. But if then they picked you, it's like, hmm, give it some extra thought. Why have they had such trouble filling you that they considered you? Um, but also don't let that prevent you from going into the interview. It's kind of a double whammy there because like, yeah, maybe they did see something in there. That is something they actually need. Um, any Anything else? You know, one of the things you can, you know, feel free to do is you get an interview, you you know, you you potentially get an interview at a place or you get a job, um, you can kind of go behind their back and try to find somebody on LinkedIn and go like, hey, I'm interested in talking to you about your experience at this company. And, you know, get some on the ground, um, on the ground um, information from those people. Um, that can be sometimes helpful. Uh, let's see, the next question was just about Will this be available? Because yes, and so it looks like people, I myself and Ilya both have already answered that. Uh, more questions, you know, either people want to chime in or ask in chat, feel free. Um, and yeah, that like part of the you mentioned earlier is you know it's that preparation, right? It's like you're going to find out a lot of stuff uh, potentially about a company just by looking them up and seeing some of the things that they say or do. Sometimes even some sites you'll even get, you know, feedback from other people, like what is that glass door or whatever the heck mm, it is. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, take those with grain of salt too, right? But um but yeah, you you you're the whole point of that interview is to feel them out as well. So, you know, see if there's something that's coming up or or maybe an issue and hopefully maybe ask them about it even within the interview, especially mm. if things are important to you. Yeah. Um, other questions, feel free to chat. I mean, we got a few more minutes. Um, did you want to put up some and show any of those slides uh, that you had that extra content while we're waiting on that and or finishing up? Any other slides? Hmm, what are some of the... Because um, you had, you said you had a few extra, right? Yeah, yep. Um, see any one of those that are good. <laughs> uh, I'll wait until people ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. But yeah, no, um, I think it's been very informative. It's it's nice to see, you know, again, uh, people going through the programs, being successful, and obviously, you know, it, it inspires additional folks, but um, it's also that same thing, right? You can just speak from experience on what you did and, and how you got to that spot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's really important. Uh, what are tips for production interviews and how can you stand out? Mm, yep, production interviews. I will say production, again, is all about you have to coordinate the team, deliver something on time. And guess what's a great thing to have for show you're a good producer, delivered game jam projects in short time frames with large teams. Um, and in reality, one of my best things I had for my interview, great, best examples I had for my interviews when I went for production was one of my worst experiences I had at a game jam where I was a producer and the game jam ended and everybody hated me um, because I realized I had kind of gone overboard and trying to plan out things that wasn't the way they wanted to do things. Um, and so the best thing you can do to prepare for production interviews is have great stories about production things that happened problems that you encountered and how you tried to overcome them. What steps did you take? Um, because for production, it's very hard for them to like look at a sample and see exactly whether you're, whether you're talented or not. Um, but having a great story you can tell about, I went to this game jam and I thought that we were going to make the game this way. And then this terrible thing happened and things went off the rails. And then I figured out how to redo the scope so that the scope was smaller and we were able to finish the project in time for the game, to end, game jam to end. Um, having great stories on things like those projects and your senior project, your senior capstone. You should be coming out of your senior capstones with great examples of 
understanding when you have gone off the rails and how you pivoted to improve the situation. What did you change to resolve the problem? Because <laughs> as a producer, that's what you're constantly doing, trying to realign yeah. the direction once things have gone off the rails. Yeah, no one's gonna wanna look at your schedule. They wanna know what happened and how you, like they want, they want the problem solvers, right? So yep. that's what really production's all about. Like, how do you solve problems? How do you deal with issues or deal with people that are not, you know, um, you know, either communicative or mm. producing or, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, things like that, which, you know, that does happen. And yeah. the nice happens thing is you get to the professional to, world too. Don't yeah, forget. exactly. <laughs> you get to experience, you know, some of it in, in, in the college, but you'll experience some of that in real life too, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> but that's, but that's what you're interviewing for with production. So, yeah um what else any other questions as we go awesome well any last thoughts that you want to pass on before we uh wind it down there nathan you, it was an excellent and very informative talk so we really appreciate it yeah yeah you're welcome i will say that i'm also someone who's very open to doing things like mock interviews and a like targeted portfolio critique. If you're like, Hey, I'm applying to this job and I've looked it up. I think my portfolio might be good, but I'm not sure <laughs> I can, I'm, I've gotten really good at reading between the lines of a lot of those job posts and understanding context. So I can provide you feedback yeah. on like, Hey, consider adding this. Um, one of those classes and stuff like, Hey, you're applying for a sound designer at um, Bungie. I hope you know how to do gun sounds. <laughs> like right. have that on your portfolio. <laughs> um, so that kind of thing. Um, I'm, yep. I'm experiencing that. So reach out to me if ever you want to, you want to do that. And of course, Nathan is on the, the GMU game discord and, and yeah. And obviously in your, if you're in his classes or whatever, you, you probably have discords with him there too, but uh, yeah. So but anyways, we want to say thank you. Thank you for coming out and, and talking. And I know you've been doing some stuff for us at you know, Gate Mason and other places. And so uh, it's it's very great to have uh, success stories like yours to, to lean back on and inspire. So uh, it's really great. And thanks for everybody who did show up and ask questions. It was, it was awesome. Uh, and we'll pass this along the uh, recorded video for anybody who came in late or if they want to show their friends. And, and like Nathan said, feel free to reach out to uh, himself or any of us. and. That's what we're here for. And we'll see you again next time. So thanks, everybody. Yep. See you all. And we can stop the recording.